Oh, hello, everyone. Welcome back. And thanks again for being with us on day four of the Asia Markets Forum. Um, our last presenter today is Dennis Maserol, who's coming to us live. Um, but before I pass it over to Dennis, if you'll allow me, I just have a little brief bio that I'd like to read. Um, and first of all, thanks so much for sharing your evening with us, Dennis. As a co-founder, executive director of Tractus, I'm sure you're a very occupied businessman. Um, and so with that, Mr. Meserol, uh, you are founding partner, and executive director of Tractus Asia. Um, and Dennis has led firm in advising on more than $5 billion in trade and investment transactions across a wide variety of sectors. And I presume that's 5 billion US dollars uh, so in over 25 years of living and working in Asia, Dennis has gained a strategic and operational experience running service and manufacturing organizations. So he brings this practical experience to us today um, and to his current role in assisting many companies, again, in a variety of manufacturing and services sectors from North America, from Europe, from Asia helping them to make informed decisions about where to locate their investments and how to structure and operate them for growth and profitability. So this experience, Dennis, you also bring to government agencies such as OMB and such as those that are represented um, by several of my colleagues on the line today who help SMEs with their exporting and their foreign investment decisions on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so thanks again, Dennis, for joining us. Um, we certainly do look forward to your advice, to your knowledge, um, and in advance for sharing your practical experiences so that we can help to grow our SMEs um, and so that we can help our SMEs to sell more of their goods and services um, in Vietnam especially. Over to you. Thank you, Suzanne, for the introduction. Uh, and I'm going to share my screen here. And while you're doing that, Dennis, I'll just remind folks um, okay. that we do have time with you for a Q&A. And you're going to yes. stay on the line with us 20, 25 minutes. And right. so to all of our attendees, Oops. to use the chat to type in your questions, and we'll moderate that after. Got to get rid of you guys. Yes. and. Uh, Suzanne, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody in in Canada, and bonjour. Um, you'll see here that uh, the John Evans was supposed to be the presenter. He's one of my other co-founding partners. Uh, we left the name on here on the presentation, but uh, you now you know who I am. Uh, wanted to give you a little bit of uh, you've got a little bit of background on on Tractus Asia. Uh, this is just something visual so that you can see. We've got offices across the developing markets. Um, we've been here, needs to be updated, we've been here 25 years. We celebrated our 25th anniversary in December. Um, and we've worked on, as Suzanne was saying, about $8 billion worth of different kinds of investment and trade. You know, a lot of that composed of large companies, but we also work with governments uh, in Canada and North America and the United States helping. Yeah, I'm on two lines here. Uh, just can you confirm you can hear me okay? Great. Yes, you can. Okay. So um, we've worked with, uh, you know, governments, states in the United States and provinces in Canada, um, as Suzanne was saying, and with the SMEs or new to market or medium sized firms, uh, helping them to grow their business uh, throughout Asia across a wide variety of, of different sectors. We've worked in things from the automotive industry through to zeolites. So any of those of you that are in industrial minerals, um, we'll know what, what zeolites are and, and pretty much everything in between. Um, but today, this is a hard act to follow um, because the trade counselors did such a great job of talking about the market opportunities in Vietnam in particular. Uh, so we, I just, I'm just going to touch on a few things about the Vietnam, you know, Vietnam, the market opportunities here in the beginning. Uh, but then I want to dive in and spend much more time on the actual market entry strategies. So what you need to do in order to effectively enter the market, sell your products, 
potentially even invest there, depending, depending on the kind of people that are on the call today. But uh, in general, we're, we're always very bullish on, on ASEAN. It's a fascinating sort of regional market in and of itself. Vietnam is, is fascinating, but the entire market really, we've, when, when, you, when you take a step back, there's actually no other more diverse geographic region in the world than ASEAN. So you've got these 10 countries you, uh, with over 600 million, uh, 650 million people. So some of the countries are enormous, like Indonesia with 250 million. Vietnam is large at 95, but you've got Singapore at six. And then you've got uh, com countries with uh, per capita GNP or purchasing power number one, is Singapore at you know, almost 48,000 US dollars per capita. And you've got some relatively poor ones such as Cambodia and Myanmar that are in the 1,000 US dollars uh, a month, a, a year per capita income. But there, and there's everything in between and there's every level of development and different types of development from highly agriculturally focused countries. Uh, Vietnam is, happens to be one of those. Uh, to highly high tech oriented ones like Singapore. So as you're as you're looking for opportunities, you know, if Vietnam doesn't is, doesn't fit the bill necessarily, as you've seen throughout this week, there's lots of other opportunities, you know, across ASEAN, depending on what your service is and depending on what your products are. But uh, today's all about Vietnam, so we want to focus on that. Uh, there's been some questions about COVID. Um, I was in Vietnam. I'm based in Bangkok, Thailand, by the way. This is where we started the company and it's our operational headquarters here. Um, although we've got offices around the region, one in Vietnam. And I was there in November and December working on a project with a client of ours. Had to go through quarantine. So I had to spend 15 days in a hotel before they would let me out. Um, and the reason they do that is, is Vietnam has done quite a good job of the lockdown in Vietnam to help control COVID is locking down the country. So Vietnam itself is pretty much an island. You can't get into it um, unless you have special permission. So you normally need a visa to go to um, various countries. So you need that, but you also need special permission from the Center for Disease Control there, uh, immigration and the police. And then when you do get there, you actually have to go into what's called uh, alternative state quarantine. You have to go to a hotel that you pay for it by yourself and you, you stay there for 15 days. You get tested for COVID twice, and if you're negative both times at the end of that quarantine period, you're released. And then you're pretty much things are, are, are normal. Um, and the, the economy is, reminds me what it was like post, you know, pre COVID, except people are wearing their masks much more often. Mask wearing in Vietnam was, high, was really common beforehand, before the pandemic, when people were on their motorbikes. Uh, that's the main form of transportation. But uh, everyone wears masks, and they've done an exceptional job, as you can see from this graph. Uh, this is some statistics from just January. There's very, very, there is some, been a few outbreaks here and there, but they do a very good job of, of controlling them. And that's allowed the co economy to actually remain to 2020. I think they were about 1.5% or 1% economic growth, which is, you know, booming compared to the rest of the world, places like the U.S., which was negative four percent, and and you know the U.K. was they're, they're forecasting minus twelve this past year. So despite COVID, the economy has been uh, relatively, um, relatively, relatively robust compared to everyone else. Um, just to give you an idea, in terms of the sectors, you can see maybe starting at the bottom in terms of industries, Vietnam is still a highly agriculturally focused economy. Uh, and that's growing at 2% a year, which for the agricultural industry, that's, that's quite rapid. Uh, and you may think, well, you know, what kind of export opportunities does that present for, for Canada? And you saw from the trade commissioners, there are some niche opportunities on the actual agricultural product side and food product side. But when, when you think of agriculture, you need to also think about agro industry. Uh, and it's a very broad sector. And so there's usually but what we've seen in Vietnam and in other markets in, in, in ASEAN is there's always these niche sectors. So agriculture includes rice, rubber, and aquaculture, which is things like fish farming and shrimp farming. And there's a lot of industries uh, in, place in Canada that have special products that may be able to support growth in these industries going forward. We've worked with companies, um, not Canadian, but other ones that have these niche products that they can sell into the agricultural sector because it's doing very well. Obviously, there's industry that's growing tremendously that's fueled by foreign direct investment. 
uh, so foreign companies uh, investing in Vietnam to manufacture products for export. Uh, and a lot of that is uh, based on the, uh, the strategy of uh, China plus one. So there's lots of companies that are in China. They've, they've suffered in some cases by rising costs. So China for some products is not the lowest cost place to, uh, to manufacture. Sorry about that. Um, and, and or because a lot of companies were exporting to the United States and what with the tariff increases uh, that we've seen over the last couple of years, they needed another place to locate their investment for their US bound exports. And Vietnam is high on the list of attractive places to invest for manufacturing for export. So the manufacturing, the, the manufacturing industry is growing rapidly because it's driven by this foreign direct investment. It's driven by domestic investment. Um, and exports. And, and again, uh, where there's exports, there's demand for raw materials, intermediate materials, subcomponents, and services uh, that, that these exporters need to fulfill their, um, their export um, uh, demand. The Vietnamese, although you can see it's, manufacturing is a large part of the economy, it's not very deep. So there's not a lot of supporting industries. And what products, supporting industry products uh, that can't be manufactured in Vietnam tend to be imported. Uh, and then on the top, you see services uh, and, and a lot of that uh, driven by retail, driven by increasing consumer spending. So as the economy has, has grown over the last decade sharply, uh, so has the incomes of uh, Vietnamese. Uh, their purchasing power has gone up and they're spending money on, on retail products and such. So there's opportunities all across the retail sec uh, sector, again, depending on what your product or service may look like. Um, we've been in Vietnam since uh, 2007 uh, and it's always been an exciting market for us. It's always, almost throughout that entire uh, 13, 14 year period, it's been the fastest growing market in ASEAN for us or, or tied with some of the other ones. Um, and, and it's still, and it's continued to expand when other, some of the other markets, you know, in more traditional markets in ASEAN, Thailand, the Philippines, Malaysia, and Indonesia have stagnated a little bit. They're not growing nearly as fast. Um, and, you know, this growth um, we're seeing driving uh, consumer spending uh, and opportunities to, for ready to eat food, as you can see, consumer, you know, food consumption is growing up by 15%. Um, annually in terms of its percentage of GDP. Not surprising given uh, Vietnam's current uh, level of development. And so that's opportunities for, for niche food products, both fresh and packaged uh, and or uh, products that go into the, uh, into the food products that are manufactured in Vietnam already. For example, uh, Vietnam's a pretty big dairy producer in and of itself. They don't do a lot of export. Uh, but there's you know demand for uh, dairy cattle genetics uh, and things like that and services and equipment and such that can be used in uh, dairy farming to make it more productive. Those are the so those are the types of um, opportunities that we always see in these developing markets. People look at maybe per capita uh, GNP and say, oh my gosh, the purchasing power parity or the purchasing power of these particular com co uh, countries quite low. What, how am I possibly going to sell my product, but you really need to look, do your research, look very carefully at what uh, the sectors there are. And, you know, this is a good example. Um, look at what's being exported, because if it's being exported, it means it's being manufactured. And now, and if it's being manufactured, depending on the kind of product it is, so, you know, coffee and those types of things made from agricultural products, there's maybe nothing you can directly provide, but coffee uh, and Vietnam is one of the largest coffee producers in the world. They're, they're not only you know, exporting beans, but you know, they're roasting them. They're producing uh, some uh, final products. There could be some niche services and or equipment that you can sell into the market um, for, for, those, uh, for those sectors. Uh, another big market is footwear. So athletic footwear and other types of um, footwear growing tremendously as um, as some of these manufacturers move out of higher cost countries, uh, places like China, they're looking for other places to locate. We're working with one major manufacturer, a couple major manufacturers, um, helping them to, well, one company actually set up their first manufacturing in Vietnam because they were manufacturing the subcomponents that are used in athletic shoes. Uh, uh, they weren't available locally. Another company um, that we've worked with uh, is 
a smaller one, uh, and they need and they've used one of the strategies I'm going to talk about to enter the market. So they've been exporting and selling, and their salespeople have been kind of flying in, and they and they want to put somebody on the ground, and they want to do that cost effectively without setting up a company. And I'll talk to you about how you can possibly do that. They're selling adhesives and special kinds of chemical products that go into the footwear market. So. Uh, in order to make the shoes. None of the, the highly niche chemicals and, and specialty chemicals and coatings that are used in the footwear that's made in Vietnam are, are actually made in Vietnam. It's all imported. So lo even, lots of opportunities for um, exports uh, for exports from Canada, even looking at the industries uh, that are exporting from Vietnam. Um, and then on the import side, that's more direct. So if you're doing your research um, and the trade commissioners talk about some of the different opportunities, um, but you can see what the opportunities are here in terms of what's being imported into Vietnam. And just because there's some small numbers on some of these, uh, some of these sectors or these products doesn't necessarily mean that there's not a market for your product or your service because it may be better positioned than, than, uh, than your competitors. So doing your research, um, is important working and of course working with the trade commissioners um, is a great way to to find out what you need to find out um, and these were some other sectors and such where uh, showing the types of things that are being exported directly from Canada but we heard quite a lot about the opportunities um, in for these products from the trade commissioner so I won't spend a lot of time on on this slide um, or this slide I think it's better to uh, jump into understanding what your market entry options are for Vietnam, uh, what's out there, and kind of the most important fa uh, issue that you need to think about is, um, you know, are you ready? Uh, and you need to do your research to find out what are the market, what are the markets, what are the market segments, and what are the, you know, market niches. In in many cases, you have to do quite a bit of hard work to see if there's opportunities um, for your product. Now, Vietnam is, as I said, a very fast growing market, but I heard a, a couple of times, I was glad to hear it, that um, it's a developing economy. Um, it's, a, it's a command economy, so it's a socialist uh, economy. And so the, the government likes to guide it. And there's quite a number of regulations, it's a highly regulated market. Uh, it's relatively open in terms of the sectors and the things that you can do there and export there, uh, but, to, it's cumbersome is probably the best word. And you need to be aware of that um, as you uh, determine the market opportunity. A and then after you determine there's a market opportunity, you need to see if there's a business case for your product, right? You need to look at whatever pricing, your pricing structure, your positioning, your competitors. Can you uh, effectively export to the market or uh, enter that market? Uh, and if so, uh, what's the what's the strategy for doing so? And one of the advantages that I know we work with a lot with, uh, just because of our backgrounds, we work a lot with U.S. companies, um, and the U.S. really uh, missed the boat, no pun intended here with the picture, in not joining the the TPP uh, several you know four years ago. Uh, and Canada has a, a great opportunity to leverage um, its participation in the, now the CPTPP, uh, which over the, as you can see, the, there are a lot of products and the commissioners talked about it that are currently duty-free. And there's some other ones where the Vietnamese government has taken the option of uh, slowly removing tariffs over time. So there's things like beef and pork um, are not yet fully, um, fully tariff-free, but they will be. Uh, and there's, but but there are a lot of op opportunities for um, getting into the market. Now, the commissioner has also talked about because it's regulated, uh, you need to be aware of as in developing your strategy and in doing your research, the, the types of product licensing that you're going to need to do. So you need product licenses in Vietnam, and then you need import licenses, which if you're uh, doing it yourself, you would. Uh, you would get these licenses. You have to have a local legal entity, some local local legal entity to uh, obtain these, li apply for these licenses for you and, and hold them. Um, and we'll talk about some of the strategies for doing that. Uh, using a distributor agent is one of them uh, and how you find them and, and how you leverage them is um, going to be important. Um, so once you've done your research, 
once you've determined that there's a market opportunity, that uh, there's a business case for your product or service, uh, you check the regulations to make sure that uh, your product or service can comply. So if you have, we've worked with companies in medical devices and medical supplies, highly regulated in, in almost every market, and uh, you'll find the same in Vietnam. So you'll need not only product licenses and import licenses, but certificates of free sale, showing that you have registration in your home market and you're able to sell in your home market, uh, plus uh, other types of standards. Uh, that that might be required, uh, again, depending on your kind of product. So once you've done all your homework, once you've uh, decided that you've got a product, you, you, it, although it's regulated, um, you have the right to, you have the right certifications and such to be able to, to sell something in Vietnam, then you need to decide what your strategy is. And there's really, really four main strategies that we talk about when we talk to companies about selling into any uh, market or selling cross-border. There's direct sales, and there was a question about e-commerce. So that certainly is an option, and that's maybe the best way to put your toe in the water and test the market. Um, there's looking for channel partners. So that could be uh, distributors or agents, and that's by far the typical uh, way of looking at it. And then there's an in-country presence. And most people think about an in-country presence as setting up a company uh, locally, but there's a kind of a halfway uh, to do that, and then you can outsource. So you can rely on outsourcing companies, and I'll explain that in a little bit, uh, to be able to be an employer of record for your employee. The, if you have employees in Canada that you want to send, you know, an expat, expatriate, uh, or if you want to employ um, uh, Vietnamese uh, locals, uh, Vietnamese nationals locally. And of course, the 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 if you really want to go all in, you can set up a, a local company. So um, I don't have too many slides on these. I'll just leave this up. But e-commerce is booming. I'll talk about e-commerce first. And that's booming in Vietnam. It's booming in Southeast Asia like it is in North America. Uh, but it looks a little bit different. So the e-commerce market in Vietnam last year was worth about $14 billion. So it seems small in comparison to North America. Um, but it's been growing at about 20% a year. So high growth. And if you want to enter, uh, if you want to access the market through e-commerce, it's, it's actually the best way to do that is through the local e-commerce platform. So everybody in North America and Canada is familiar with, um, with Amazon. That's probably the best way to get into the Canadian market or the, uh, the North American market, uh, but, but not in Southeast Asia and not in Vietnam. And v there's four other companies that have platforms. One is called Shopee. You, these you've probably never heard of. But they're enormous companies. They're very successful, um, and they're the platforms that you want to be on. Um, one's called Shopee. There's another one called Lazada, uh, and then there's two other local ones called Tiki, and uh, it, another one with a very strange Vietnamese name. But those are the top four, and they provide the payment mechanisms. They provide the actual transaction platform, and they provide, in some of them, provide some value-added services for warehousing and fulfillment such that you can keep products locally and because of the distance, you can keep products locally that, and ship them to your customers uh, to meet their expectations. Um, and so the, and one, way, one is a way to test the waters, but you still need a product because of the distance. You need a, a high value to weight uh, ratio product because you're, it'll end up being shipped to air freight. Uh, but, and some of the kinds of products that are really commonly uh, purchased online in Vietnam right now, electronics, kind of the typical e-commerce product, electronics, fashion and beauty, uh, food and personal care, uh, furniture and appliances wouldn't be something that the, the companies that are on the line would be involved in, uh, toys, uh, do-it-yourself, uh, and hobbies. The, there's, uh, just in terms of getting an idea of what this is like, there's 68 million internet user, users out of the 95 million people that are in Vietnam. And 55 million of them, so almost 90% uh, you know, of all the uh, the internet people with internet access purchased something online in 2019, and the average purchase was 54 U.S. dollars, which which isn't bad, considering the uh, the average per capita income in, in Vietnam. So best way to enter the market in uh, on, from the e-commerce side is through these local players. Now to do that. 
there's still some investment that you need to make. So the best way uh, to succeed in e-commerce in any cross-border market is localization. So if you're selling a, a product that's suitable for e-commerce, you probably also have your own corporate website. That really needs to be localized in the Vietnamese language so that companies that are looking, when they look at your online presence through a, an e-commerce platform and they want to look at your products so or they want to look at you know, who you are as a company, they can access that information in Vietnamese. Um, you may want to, if you're using social media to do your marketing, uh, you would want to localize that. Uh, not necessarily on, and, and you'd want to localize that on the platforms that are used in Vietnam. So Facebook is, happens to be one of the ones that's big in Vietnam. Uh, if you have digital content that goes along with your products, brochures and those types of things, they should be localized. And in some cases, you might uh, find it uh, cost-effective to localize some of the packaging with specialized, or you may need to because of the regulatory requirements with specialized labeling. Um, and, and the statistics are really clear across the globe. Uh, companies that are selling through an e-commerce platform and channel, they're much more effective when they do some form of localization. Um, we've got some statistics and information on that that we can share with you, you if you'd like. Um, the most common way to uh, enter a market is through uh, agents or distributors uh, that was talked about kind of extensively with the trade commissioners. Uh, and typically an agent or distributor is relied on heavily uh, by an exporter or a manufacturer to do the importing, customs clearance, warehousing and inventory, uh, marketing, sales fulfillment. Um, if it's a technical product, uh, it may require uh, preventive maintenance, it may require calibration, it may be something that uh, you would have to repair and or do some type of technical support and training. Uh, for the customer. Uh, and as I mentioned, usually companies are relying on uh, an agent or distributor to do uh, product licensing um, or import licensing um, and even trademark registration. So if you have a trademark, if you have a brand or you have a trademark that you want to, uh, that you want to trademark in Vietnam, um, that'll need to be done all locally. What you need to be careful about and why it's critical to find the right partner is in a place like Vietnam and in Vietnam, the regulations are such that you need a local legal entity to apply for these product and import licenses and or your uh, and or a trademark. You have to be careful if you let your distributor do that, they then become the, the product license, the import license and the trademark license owner. So if they don't turn out to be the best distributor for you and you need to separate, uh, you may lose control of your product registrations and your product licensing. So it's really critical to find the best partner. I mean, it, for to us, it's critical to find the best partner in any market because of the time and effort it takes to work with them and get them up to speed and, and get them to know your product or service. But it's even more critical in, in, in Vietnam because of some of these these issues with product licensing and um, a, a import licensing and then trademark registration. So to us, it's all about process, finding the right agent, finding the right distributor it takes research, but it takes a good process. And the process that we use is, we, we use when we're helping companies, but you can also do this yourself. You can manage the process yourself. Um, is very systematic. So you, we suggest that you sit down and you try to define some factors that are critical uh, in a good distributor. So what factors you need uh, such that if that company doesn't meet those criteria or those factors, you shouldn't be considering them at all. And so some things like that could be, you know, do they have a nationwide distribution network? So is your market nationwide? Do you need somebody that when you start on the ground, um, they have a nationwide network? Uh, are they not? Are they representing any products uh, from your competitors that you so you wouldn't want them to be representing yours or your service? Are they representing products that are complementary to you that would be helpful because sometimes your product is sold as a package with for technical sometimes technical products are sold that way, or if they're selling complementary products they'll have a much better understanding of your product and service and the market. And so it'll just be easier for them to get up to speed. The learning curve will be much, much less. Um, and, and then, of course, a critical 
a factor for us is do, do they have an interest in working with you? Do they, have an, do they really passionate about the kind of products that you're selling or the services that you're selling? Um, so that's that's a first screen. So we, you, you need to make sure that your distributor or agent really has this, it really meets these critical factors before you want to continue. And, and that may require vetting or screening or eliminating dozens of companies, uh, depending on your market and depending on the kind of product or service that you're selling. After you do that, we what we like to call is what's left are companies that meet all your critical factors are um, a long list, a qualified long list. And so maybe there's five or 10 companies left. Well, you know, you can't be negotiating or trying uh, trying to work with 10 different companies to figure out if they're the best one for you. We then suggest you define some other factors that are important to selecting the, the, uh, the distributor, but that aren't critical uh, to their success. Uh, and, and these are, they could range from a lot of, uh, just a, a wide range, but they're, they're not critical. Identify these important factors, kind of think to yourself what five or six key attributes um, are, are necessary uh, for you to be successful, maybe the attributes that you found successful in distributors that you've uh, brought on board uh, in other markets. Uh, and then it, once you've identified those factors, then kind of put a weight on them, which, which ones are more important. If you have five or six, are they equally important? Are they, if there's five factors, are they equally sort of 20% of the decision of which one to choose is based on a given factor? Or, or, or uh, certain uh, certain of the important uh, factors more important than the other. Um, and then continue to do your research and due diligence, uh, getting information uh, about the particular company, their financial wherewithal, uh, the, the character references and other reference of, of the vendors, references from the businesses that they're working with, other principles that they may be working with, um, if they're uh, also distributing complementary products, how long they've been in the business. These are the kind of things that the trade commissioner um, can can help with. The, the trade commissioners from Canada can help with. You can also do your own homework um, or and you can find other resources uh, on the ground uh, if you're still having difficulty. But once you've uh, got those criteria, once you've done your research and rated each of the distributors against those criteria, then you can see, you add up the, the scores and you can see which one scores the highest, which one or two companies score the highest. And those are the ones, then you can spend the time and effort to, uh, to start developing a relationship with. Maybe you want to uh, appoint two companies to be a distributor in different regions of the country or for different uh, product mixes, if you have different product types, uh, just to gauge uh, who might be the most successful uh, and give them a year and see how it works out uh, and then choose one over the other. You know, let them know that. Divide them by region, uh, regionally. Maybe you want somebody in the north or the south uh, to to see how that goes. But it's just critical that you spend a lot of time up front uh, looking at what the potential options are uh, because of how critical it is. How much? How it's a lot. You're a long distance away. It's a very challenging market and can be cumbersome in many ways. There isn't still lots of opportunities, but you need to put the time and the effort to make sure you get the right you get the right partner. If you've already got a distributor in the market, maybe um, things are going all right uh, and your business is growing. Um, maybe you have uh, you, but you need a little more technical support, or that distributor or distributor network that you have, or customer network you have if you've been successful selling directly. Uh, and you want to put somebody on the ground, I alluded to one way you can without setting up a company uh, is to use outsourcing services. So uh, there's companies, HR companies can do this or corporate secretarial firms can do this. And what they can do is they can be an employer of record uh, for your staff member. And this could be an expatriate. Uh, it could be somebody from Canada um, or it could be a local person uh, who they can employ. And then you can also work with other Kind of outsourcing firms, serviced offices if you need some office space for that individual, um, accounting services and such for man managing expenses and those types of things, uh, and the trade commissioners and other resources, the Canadian Chamber of Commerce can provide you with 
sources of these kinds of companies that can provide this outsourcing service. It, it also happens to be something that Attractus does. We call it our business incubator. Um, where we work with companies and we provide all those services ourselves in kind of one place. Plus, we can provide some management support and oversight to, to help that local staff person on the ground and to help you manage that person that you may have on the ground because you, you are 10,000 miles away um, and being out of sight and out of mind is not, is not the best way to, to provide oversight over an individual um, that's on the ground. So we've done that effectively in many of the markets in, in Southeast Asia, this kind of halfway point between using distributors effectively and or exporting directly effectively, but before you may want to consider uh, putting an investment on the ground. Um, it's low cost, it's low risk, um, it's very, to get somebody on the ground uh, where you can, that's, that's an employee that can control, where you can control them much better than a distributor, for example, um, is much faster than trying to set up your own organization. Um, it's scalable. You can add one or two people even before you make a decision about investing. Um, and it's flexible. If that doesn't work out, if the market doesn't work out, it, you can't, it doesn't make sense to have those, the, those resources on the ground. Um, it's also very flexible because you can cancel uh, these outsourcing relationships usually on a very short term basis uh, and then separate the individuals um, that you were, you were working with uh, and uh, you're out of the market. Whereas if you make a foreign direct investment, if you set up a local company um, in, in Vietnam, it's not that difficult. It doesn't take that a long, uh, long period of time. And I'll, I'll describe that in a minute. Uh, but trying to unwind the company in any market is about 10 times more complicated. And it takes uh, quite a lot of time and expense to do it right uh, because of the tax considerations and legal considerations. Much easier to set up than it is to actually um, to actually shut down. So it's important to, uh, to look at other alternatives and outsourcing is a very, very viable one. But if you do want, if you are big enough, large enough, you've got the capital, it does make sense to invest in a place like Vietnam, you can do that. Uh, the Most of the sectors are open uh, to be foreign companies being able to do business there. And I'll explain that in a minute. And the, the legal entities that you could possibly choose from are pretty familiar to most companies. So you can set up a branch office. So that's a branch of your Canadian company. Uh, that's not usually a, uh, a widely chosen um, strategy only because, or structure only because it presents some tax, con ta some, typically presents some negative tax consequences. There may be some negative tax consequences. Um, there's a representative office. So you can have a legal entity on the ground where you have your own employees and you have your own office. Uh, but the only thing that a representative office doesn't allow you to do is invoicing. So you can't invoice locally in local currency. You still have to invoice from the, your parent company in Canada. Uh, but in some cases, that makes more sense when you, when you don't need to or you don't want to. Your sales aren't, aren't high enough. Or you want to run your sales through your distributor or agent network. And you really just need the representative office to provide technical support and oversight. Uh, and, but you don't want to use an outsourcing um, arrangement. And then the third way is to form uh, in Vietnam what's called a limited liability company, a limited liability corporation or an in, incorporate a company. And, and you can do that. You can be a 100% uh, wholly Canadian owned um, company in Vietnam in just about every sector. There's only six sectors um, that are off limits completely. Uh, and uh, there are things like drugs and narcotics, hazardous chemicals, and then some really niche, unusual um, business sectors that I won't bother going into because they're so unusual. It only takes uh, about one to three months to set up a company. Um, it's a pretty cumbersome process because of the paperwork and such. You need to be approved uh, to set up. You need to be, your investment application needs to be vetted by the local government uh, to see whether it's appropriate. Do they really want you there? So you have to be approved to invest. It's not just filling out the paperwork like typically you would do in Canada or, or, or North America. Uh, you actually have to be vetted and approved. They want, they need to want you there. So that's cumbersome in that respect. Uh, the capital requirements aren't very high. Typical, typical, typical small company startups are about ten thousand U.S. dollars. Um, and then the product registrations and the import licensing, if you want to handle them, and that's one of the reasons to have your own representative office is you could then 
um, because you have a legal entity, you can do your product registrations, your import registrations, your trademark registrations, and hold those licenses um, and, and not have to worry about it. On, on a, a side note, if you work with the agents and distributors, I'm sure one of the questions is going to be, well, how do I protect myself on the product registration and uh, import licensing and trademark registration uh, aspect if I need a local entity? Well, there are reliable uh, service firms who can hold those licenses for you. Law firms can do that. There's some accounting firms that do that. We've done that for some companies, for some of our clients. So if you find a reliable uh, service partner that's not in the business uh, and is not related to your distributor agent, that, that's one good way to protect yourself um, when, you, uh, when you do find a distributor agent. Um, there are some restricted sectors. Uh, they're, they're not very onerous. They're quite unusual. Uh, they're restricted, meaning you need to be approved. So you can apply uh, for these, but for the most part, it's highly unlikely that you'll get involved in them. And just to give you some examples, I'm looking at the list here. Uh, courier services, advertising, education, electronic games, mining, uh, maritime transport, aircraft, you know, and, and airlines and those types of things, telecommunications, those typical market segments that are highly restricted, even in places uh, like Canada or other developed markets. Then there's a broader range of uh, industries and industry segments that are conditional, meaning you need to apply uh, and, and or you need to meet certain requirements in order to make those investments. Um, things like, uh, major investments over uh, 220 million US dollars in capital, um, airports and seaports, mining, uh, oil extraction, cigarette manufacturing, things like economic uh, development zones. Um, the government will look at your application for the investment or look at your application to set up a company and they may have a, they may decide that the, the particular sector that you're in may have a foreign shareholding requirement. It may have an employment requirement. It may have a capital requirement in order for you to register the company. Now, my understanding is, sorry about this, people. Uh, my understanding is that most of the people are most of the companies on the call on the uh, on the uh, event tonight are smaller, medium-sized firms, and you're unlikely to be making you're unlikely to be making an investment. Uh, but in case you're interested, in case you're at that point um, in your uh, development curve. Those are some of the things that that uh, you can get support. You can get support from through the trade commissioners and or the you know the Canadian Chamber of Commerce. They can pr uh, provide you with re references and and different service providers that could help you get your company set up. And as we said, um, Vietnam and the uh, in the beginning of the, the first presentation different than Canada. Uh, and this gives you a little bit of an idea of some of the cultural differences. There were some questions about what are the cultural differences between the North and the South. This is kind of a fascinating one. Um, this organization looks at the cultural differences between different countries. Um, and you can see things like power differences. There's more deference in in Vietnam. These, these power differences uh, between older and younger people or between bosses and their supervisors the super uh, and their employees. Uh, there's there's a much more uh, it's a much more hierarchical cultural uh, country than it is in Canada uh, because of it's very strongly based on Confucianism uh, and like these this type of power di distance difference that you see in Vietnam is is pretty common across Asia. Same thing on the converse is individualism. Uh, there, the Vietnamese are more concerned about social cohesion and less about uh, individual uh, needs and aspirations and such, more concerned about their family. Uh, the uh, of, you know, uncertainty avoidance is uh, a, a lar in a large part uh, concern about making a mistake. So if things are uncertain, means you don't know what the outcome is going to be like, and therefore you may make a mistake. And if you make a mistake, you'll lose face. I think a lot, a lot of you may have heard of that concept, or you may be embarrassed. And uh, the Vietnamese, like most of the rest of Southeast Asia, want to avoid uh, embarrassment uh, as much as they can. And it looks like the uncertainty avoidance is between Vietnamese and Canadians is, is closer than it is in some other uh, in some other cultures that we've looked at. Uh, and then you can see the long-term orientation, quite a big difference between Canadians and Vietnamese. Uh, 
Uh, and one of the things there you can is if you look uh, uh, evidence of that is if you look at the uh, savings rate in Vietnam is extraordinarily high, um, like it is in quite a number of other Asian economies. Uh, the Vietnamese save a lot for the future for their families, their children's education, um, retirement even. And so they're doing those things. And so it just gives you a snapshot of that and gives you just a, some flavor of some of the things, to, the differences between Canada and the uh, and Vietnam. So as you're thinking about entering the market uh, in one way, shape or form, uh, we've all over the last say, two hours, we've all talked about the need to do your research uh, to see whether you're ready. I mean, and, and what, so part of that research is looking internally, you know, do you have the, the capital um, and the finances to invest in the research that needs to be done, uh, the, 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 the localization of products or services, uh, whether you're e-commerce or not. Um, and the way you can do that is, is the best thing is to have somebody local in the market to help you with. There's lots of nuances. It's a, it, can be a, it can be a difficult market to, to get an understanding of what uh, the opportunities are. That's what the trade commissioners are there to help for. There's information, there's webinars that the Canadian Chamber of Commerce in Vietnam um, holds from time to time. And even if you're not based in Vietnam, you can become associate members of chambers. And we highly recommend that if you're seriously considering entering a market. It's a great way to meet other Canadian companies um, that are already doing business that can be resources for you um, and or to meet service providers that might be able to support you in your market analysis, your market entry, product registrations and those types of things. Um, and then uh, you need to think about what your strategy is. Where are you in your business uh, development uh, timeline uh, and maturity in Southeast Asia? If you've been in a lot of the markets already uh, and you already have a lot of experience in, in the rest of uh, Southeast Asian markets, you've got some, you've got distributors set up on the ground and that's a very effective for you. Uh, and you really know what you're need. You, you need, you need, you really know the kind of company you're looking for as a distributor you can jump right into it. If you're not sure whether your product is going to uh, make sense for the market and it happens to be a consumer product or something that you can sell um, through e-commerce, you know, that's a good way to give it a try. Um, or if you're already active, you already ha maybe have some people have an office on the ground somewhere in Southeast Asia, maybe you're in Singapore and you feel like you really need to have somebody on the ground um, that you can consider as your employee, you might wanna consider uh, an outsourcing relationship first so that you don't have to go to the expense and effort um, and difficulty of setting up a, a, a company that uh, until you've uh, evaluated and, and actually confirmed whether that makes the most sense or not. And then if you're ready to go all in, of course, uh, there's actually making the investment and setting up a legal entity in, in Vietnam. So we, as we said, we're really bullish on ASEAN. We're bullish on Vietnam. It's a, it's a great, uh, exciting market to be in because it's growing so uh, so rapidly. Uh, I always like going there uh, and spending time uh, in the north and in the south. Very different places to do business. Uh, and it, but looking, taking a step back and looking at ASEAN, and that really should be your first step. And that's what this week is all about: helping you to see which markets you might want to prioritize over others. Uh, so that you can focus your research on one versus uh, versus the other and see which is the most high priority. Uh, and then you can drill down and decide what your strategy is uh, and how you should actually take advantage of those opportunities. So with that, uh, I hope that was helpful. Um, one, maybe, I guess now's the time to open the, open the floor to some questions. Thank you, Dennis. Yes, I think that was- You're welcome. Exceptionally helpful. Take a glass uh, of water. Yeah, absolutely. Very detailed. Um, there are, just looking at the time here, I do want to address just a few questions that have come up. Um, so if we could ask now, her, just to indulge. And Suzanne, just, yeah. Suzanne, just one of the thing, um, a lot of the, a lot of the narrative uh, came from actually a, a webinar that I did last week for the Canadian ASEAN Business Council yes. of the CABC. And so we have a presentation for that. So we can, we can share that with your uh, your companies as well. That would be very helpful. Thank you. We were aware of the of the um, of the webinar. I think it was last Thursday evening. Yes. Um, so there's one question here, and if you could just touch on very quickly, um, what are some of the key costs of doing business in Vietnam? 
Oh, well, I'll have to toss that back as a question. Um, what, um, you know, it depends on what kind of business you're planning on doing. I mean, if you're planning on investment in setting up a company, there's, there's certain costs there. If you're planning on, you know, and I, I talked a little bit about what the capital requirements of setting up a company are, but that's, there's also the operating costs as well, but um, versus if you're going to find an agent or, you know, a distributor, or if you're going to use an e-commerce uh, platform as an example. So could you give me an understanding of how you're thinking or what would the strategy be for to, uh, sure. Sure. Let's to look, enter the market? Let's look at the cost of, of, um, of um, hiring the right partner, the right agent, the right distributor. What would we be looking at? Are we looking at an annual salary? Are we looking at a retainer? Um, or, um, Oh, yeah. I see. Okay, University very good. Fee. Yeah. Yeah. Typically, um, like in most markets, uh, when you have an agent or a distributor relationship, uh, you, you, I mean, there's there's no cost for that. You're not. It, 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 this would be usually an agent or distributor has their own company, um, and uh, there it doesn't cost you anything to, uh, other than the time and effort to do the research. Uh, you know, to do the the legal docu the, the the due diligence, and then to to set up a distributor uh, agreement, uh, mm -hmm. the legal costs of doing that. But then it's up to the uh, the agent to then take it from there, or the distributor to take it from there. And usually, in your distribution agreement, you'll have if it's a product that may be the easiest way to look at it. Uh, you'll have some minimum requirements for inventory that they'll need to take, and or sales that they'll need to to make. And usually, with a distributor, you're just selling to them and then at a at a wholesale price for example and then they'll mark it up and, and sell it locally depending on what their costs of distribution are mm -hmm. and so it really doesn't cost you anything from the point of you exporting uh, the, the 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 product to uh, to vietnam and again that could be that's all up to what your agreement might be like are you right. exporting it on a cif basis are you exporting it on an fob basis so the distributor actually has to pay the shipping those are the, the nuts and bolts that you would work out in the distribution agreement. Okay. And would the typical SME from North America that you've been advising um, require to invest in localized um, brand building, localized sales promotion activities, or can this be, generally speaking, the role at the expense of that, yes. that local partner? Agreed. Yes, it can be. Uh, it it kind of depends on your wherewithal and how much control you want to have. So, if you're a smaller company, those would be all all of those things you would want to have your distributor um, take care of and be responsible for. Uh, and of course, they may come back and they say, "Well, look, that impacts our costs." And so, depending on what your FOB or the CIF price is, uh, that'll impact the discussions you have in terms of a uh, a transfer price, the price that you're going to sell your product to them. Mm -hmm. uh, in some cases, they'll come back and say, well, in terms of marketing or advertising costs, uh, typically they may ask to split that or they may ask you to contribute. And that contribute, contribution could be in terms of cash, but uh, typically you could negotiate uh, a contribution in kind. So marketing materials and things, maybe you'll pay for the localization of what you already have the marketing materials, you already have the materials, you'll pay, right. you'll pay for the localization of them. But again, that's a commercial decision. If you'd rather not, you, you don't have to. A lot of the times you can just push all of that onto the distributor. There will be the cost of, an, as I mentioned, we'd highly recommend that you have, you hire some type of service agency, a law, a law firm, and maybe it's a law firm that you'd be using for your distributor or agency agreement to hold your product registrations and your import licensing and your trademark registrations. Um, or it could be other types of a corporate, a corporate secretarial firms, a consulting firms, again, like I said, those are the kind of things we do. So provided that, you, you know, you've checked their references and, and are, they're a reputable firm mm -hmm. uh, and you can find out those, you can get references from the, the, the trade commissioner and or the Canadian chamber. Mm -hmm. uh, you can have them hold those, those legal licenses, which, which protects you, which protect you in the distributor agreement. Would you find that um, getting IP protection or trademarking in, in Vietnam be typically expensive? Um, it's time consuming. Oops, sorry. We've actually, so our Tractus, if you see on some of our um, materials, uh, our Tractus, uh, uh, we've registered a couple trademarks there. Uh, and we did it ourselves. We have, we have people on the ground. So if you're using for something like that, 
you can usually go with a, a reputable local uh, law firm and you're probably going to be spending uh, maybe five thousand uh, dollars for that process but it, that what 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 it, it could take a couple of years to get it done mm. certainly no more than no more than five thousand us sometimes but an investment. It's a local firm but an investment in yes an investment in protecting your trademark if that's very valuable for you yes yeah um, so we're going to wrap it up with one final question and go back to the culture question. So give, a, give us the, the big tip, if you will, for the, for the North American, for the Atlantic Canadian business person that's going into a meeting for the first time with um, a potential Vietnamese partner, mm -hmm. um, supplier, buyer. What do we need to be mindful of? There's you know, there's the cultural side of it, but one of the very important things to think about always is to just be prepared, um, so that you know uh, you you can ask some Colombo questions and or that you know as much as you can about that partner before you actually go into a meeting. It could be a you know this could be a Zoom call instead of a meeting. Sure. Um, but I mean, we think the kind of business etiquette, just being professional. Um, being uh, straightforward and, um, you know, not putting somebody on the spot necessarily uh, if, and, and asking them questions, uh, face is important, um, always, uh, you know, letting them speak, not if they say something, they may be, you may end up meeting somebody that's, that's, that's boastful or trying to show that their uh, capabilities may be more than they actually are. You probably don't want, if you've done your research, you may not want to call them out on that. Or if you, they don't tell you that you're representing, uh, that they're representing um, particular complementary products when you know they are, you don't probably, you don't want to call them out on that directly. You want to try to do things indirectly in some cases. Um, and or those types of things, if they're not as straightforward as you think they are, which they may not be, uh, this the direct communications is, um, is is not as 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 common as uh, as in uh, Canada for sure. Um, you you want to be indirect when, where you can, uh, and it's also helpful to have some kind of interlocutor, some support uh, that where that. Some kind of support with somebody that speaks the local language. So yeah, obviously you'll need to be communicating and they'll need to be fluent in English, but it's always helpful to have uh, somebody on your side uh, to be able to to speak to them in Vietnamese as well as part of that research uh, and, and relationship building. We think there needs to be a balance on both sides. Wonderful. That's very helpful advice. Um, so I think with that, Dennis, we'll close. Um, okay. Thank you again for your excellent presentation and, and most helpful advice. You're welcome, Susan. Folks, folks will have your contact information. And of course, we keep all the presentations saved up on our um, event platform. For those of you who want to join us tomorrow and haven't registered, you can certainly do that by clicking on the session information and just popping it in your email. Um, and again, Dennis, so thank you um, for, for spending the evening with us. Um, and thanks to you and your team for helping us to coordinate all of the sessions this week. I, I personally have learned so much um, about these emerging markets and, and I do hope that our audience feels the same way. Um, so we'll conclude day four then um, and hopefully you'll be able to join us again tomorrow. Um, Dennis's colleague Uday will join us again. We just have one presentation tomorrow. Today is going to wrap us up with a conversation about Southeast Asia generally um, with a focus again on Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand and Philippines all wrapped up in in one quick one hour period. Um, but Dennis, I am glad that you mentioned localization and I am going to put a plug in because we do have an ongoing website localization program here in Atlantic Canada. We worked very hard all fall. To, to bring to Atlantic Canadian companies um, a series of webinars that focus on being online in several different markets around the world. 
Um, and we do have a series that's going to start up again. Um, hang on a second, because if I don't have the dates in front of me. Uh, we'll post that information on our session. I think the dates are coming up throughout February. Um, and there are some spotlights on some of these as ASEAN and Asian markets that we've talked about this week. Um, and so with that, everybody, thank you again. Uh, je souhaite une très bonne journée. Thank you and have a wonderful day.